be live. My name is Maria and I'm an e-commerce manager here at Politics and Pros Bookstore. And on behalf of the owners and the staff, I'd like to welcome you to this event. Uh, we continually strive to bring the authors you love and their new books to our Politics and Pros community. Um, we were hoping that by now we will be able to um, have, have you as guests at our lovely store. Life, however, had other plans. So instead we are uh, visiting you. And I mean, how often you can say you had Dan Jones visit you at your home, Silver Linings Day. Eh? Uh, some technical information before we start. Uh, at uh, any point during the event, you can click on the link in the chat to purchase Powers and Thrones on our Politics and Pros website. Um, additionally, you can ask the author a question by clicking on Q&A, which can be found near the bottom of your screen. And uh, while we'll try to get to everyone's questions, we apologize in advance if we don't have time to address them all. Uh, closed captions are also available for tonight's event. Uh, if you click the CC link right next to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, finally, we want to thank you for being here with us, not just today, but throughout this whole ordeal, this last year and a half. Um, your support and patience means a lot, and it, it has kept us going. And uh, now on to the main event. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dan Jones and his latest book, Powers and Thrones. Uh, it publishes here in US on the 9th of November, but you can pre-order it now. We'll drop the link uh, in the chat. Uh, Dan is a British historian and best-selling author of Crusaders, The Templars, Wars of the Roses, Magna Carta, to name a few. Um, he's also a TV presenter. He wrote and presented several documentaries and series, uh, one of the most popular ones being Netflix series Secrets of Great British Castles. Um, he's also a journalist. He's a columnist at the London Evening Standard, where he writes regularly about sports. Um, he has written for The Times, The Sunday Times, The Telegraph, The Spectator, The Daily Beast, and Newsweek. Powers and Thrones, A New History of the Middle Ages is his ninth book. Um, spanning uh, a thousand years, it tells the story of the Middle Ages, the, peri the period between the fall of the Western Roman Empire in the 5th century AD and the first wave of the Black Death in uh, 1300s. Uh, Dan has a way of recounting the story as if he was there, uh, making the centuries fall away into a vivid, immediate painting of that distant era, and he makes a thousand-year history of the Middle Ages accessible and utterly fascinating, and all the while drawing the lines between then and now. So if you haven't sorted out your Christmas shopping just yet, here's the perfect present for, for your uh, uh, loved ones. Uh, Dan is joining us from London. Hello, Dan. Um, Hello. And, hi, and a warm welcome to Neil Ferguson, who will be moderating this discussion. Uh, Neil is a Scottish historian who currently serves as the Milbank fam uh, Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, and as a Senior Faculty Fellow uh, at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University. Um, he's the author of 16 books, including Empire, How Britain Made the Modern World, Civilization, The West and the Rest, The Great Degeneration, and the most recent one, Doom, The Politics of Catastrophe. Uh, Neil, Neil is uh, joining us from Stanford. Hello. And um, so without further ado, please welcome Dan Jones and Neil Ferguson to PMP Live. Uh, Maria, it's a great pleasure to be with the politics and prose crowd again, only this time moderating rather than uh, talking about my own book. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to meet uh, Dan Jones virtually. Uh, I think we need a little uh, context, uh, Dan, for a predominantly American audience. Uh, you're in London on a particularly noisy uh, night. Uh, November the 5th is an unremarkable date in the United States, uh, and, and it commemorates an event in English history that doesn't quite fall within the scope of your enormous book. Uh, but you probably should explain what's going on or about to go on, just in case your dog get in, gets involved. Yes, it's Guy Fawkes night, uh, a night where we celebrates uh, the, the near miss of the 
attempt to blow up the Houses of Parliament back in the beginning of the 17th century by Guy Fawkes. Uh, and so people let off fire. It's also Diwali. So there are an, an enormous number of fireworks being set off. So if you hear bangs and explosions, that's perfectly normal. I do have, I've got to get him. He's a, a very nervous dog who cannot stand it. So I'm going to, here he is. He may appear and jump off my lap. Don't be alarmed by him. He doesn't care about history. He may be lulled to sleep by... Uh, well, we won't I have a conversation. We, but I, we will I, try I not to not. lull anybody but your dog uh, to sleep, Dan. <laughs> but I thought we'd better just explain, uh, because uh, an audience that heard explosions going off might jump to the wrong conclusions. <laughs> uh, uh, it's only the strange British version of July 4th. Uh, and uh, how extraordinary that we celebrate uh, an unsuccessful act of terrorism so many years after the fact. Uh, but let's go back even further uh, to the time that your wonderful new book covers, the, the, the Middle Ages. It, it's, it's one of these conversations where not only does a, a, a Scotsman meet a Welshman in an American bookstore, which sounds like the beginning of a joke, but it's also a, a modernist meets a medievalist and they try to find common grounds. And because I wrote quite a bit about the Black Death in Doom, and you write quite a bit about it uh, in this new book, it felt like it would be quite a good idea to start there because pandemics are on everybody's mind these days. And the Black Death was probably the world's worst so far as we can work that out. Uh, it comes relatively late in, in your book, chapter 13, Survivors. But, but part of the point of your book is, is to make us recognise certain aspects of the Middle Ages as familiar so that it doesn't feel like a completely alien world. And now that, that event of the mid-14th century, the Black Death, is no longer so unfamiliar to us as we have come through a pandemic of our own. I want you to talk a bit about that which is familiar about the experience of a pandemic and, and that which is different when one looks back at uh, the, uh, the people of the mid 14th century. Well, I think you're absolutely right. The, the, the Black Death has become much more familiar to us since the beginning of 2020 and the arrival of, of uh, of the COVID pandemic in Europe, I mean, partly because it's there were just so many journalistic features and, and articles and opinion pieces written about the similarities and differences between COVID and the Black Death. Um, in terms of the disease itself, there's not an enormous amount of overlap. Um, uh, the Black Death was spread, insofar as we can tell, by flea bites. Um, whereas, as we know, uh, COVID was spread on the breath. Um, the Black Death was, by an order of magnitude, much more lethal than COVID has been. And that's not to diminish the, the large global death toll in, in terms of you know, millions of people uh, in COVID. But the Black Death was not killing, you know, 1% or 2% of people whom it infected, it was killing 40%, 50%, even 60%. So the, on the basis of those numbers alone, this was uh, a very different situation. This was an, a, a much more apocalyptic um, disease. Uh, but as you've written in Doom, uh, it's not the disease, it's the response that that defines a pandemic in a way. And, and, and if I've understood what you've written in Doom anyway, and the uh, the arrival within a society, within a, a, an arrangement of global networks of a disease lights up what that society looks like. It shows you how that society thinks of itself. Um, it strips away a lot of, about a society. And I think that that, for me, writing this book, and particularly the, the bits about pandemics, the Justinianic plague and the back of Black Death, writing those during a pandemic of our very own, 
uh, helped me to think about what the point was in this narrative about the Middle Ages of including the Black Death. And it's it's not just to fill the pages with gruesome stories of people dying in agony with buboes sort of sprouting out of their armpits, which is, is often what we get from descriptions of the Black Death, but it's 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 to put it in a broader context and say, what does this show us about the medieval world? And what uh, were the limitations? What were the characteristics of the response? So that we can feel some sense of commonality if that's the right word, between the Middle Ages and our present age, because again, you're completely right. One of my overriding aims in writing Powers and Thrones was to try and demystify the Middle Ages somewhat and say, look, this is a very different world. Of course it is. But there are things that we can recognise here that will enable us to empathise, sympathise. So the familiar thing is the rapid spread of uh, novel contagion a new pathogen that the population right. has not been exposed to a sudden increase in mortality uh no remedies because there right. uh proved to be no effective remedies uh for covid as there were no effective remedies uh in the mid 14th century for the bubonic plague so those seem like obvious uh similarities and there are some other similarities too for example, the cultural consequences mm -hmm. and the political consequences of this great uh, public health disaster. Talk a little bit about the, the knock-on effects and whether you see any similarities there. Well, one of the most interesting things I think about, about the response, there are, there, are, there are two large features of the response to the Black Death in the 14th century. And one of them is, is probably more obvious than the second. The first is the religious response. Of course, the Middle Ages in the West was a time or where religion pervaded institu institutions and culture far more deeply than it does today. So in the, the chapter about the Black Death in Powers and Thrones, I start with showing that religious response. And there's a, there's a, a set piece that's in London. There's a chronicler who works for the Archbishop of Canterbury, Robert of Aysbury, goes out into the streets of London to watch a parade of Italian flagellants marching through the streets, beating themselves to try and, uh, this is a, an attempted remedy. It's an, it's an attempt to uh, plead with God, to bargain with God to spare his people. Now, of course, writing that in, in during COVID, you say, oh my God, that sounds like a super spreader event. I'm sure these flagellants weren't wearing masks, you know, was there social distancing, whatever. Okay, so but, but I think that that's probably the more familiar response when we think of the Black Death. That's what we think of in the Middle Ages. But the economic response, I think, is, is equally interesting and in some ways more important. A very good case is England. One of the governments, the, the government of the day was the royal government of Edward III. Quite early on in the reign of Edward III, Edward III, one of the more competent Plantagenet kings, his mind mostly focused on warfare and, and the early stages of the Hundred Years' War. When the Black Death arrived, 1347, 1348, 1349, the response of Edward III's government was immediately economic. And they passed first the, the Royal Ordinance of Labourers, and then that was enacted when, they, when it was possible to get a parliament together as the Statute of Labourers. And effectively what that law said was, we recognise, although it doesn't quite put it in these terms, we recognise that because a large number of workers have died of the Black Death, that there is now an increased demand for workers and that therefore wages are rocketing up. Uh, it speaks of the malice of labourers uh, in taking higher wages than they had been accustomed to. Um, and, and that term, the malice of, uh, of the workers, tells us about the mindset of this legislation, because what the Ordnance Statute of Labourers sought to do was to freeze all wages at a pre-pandemic level. So as where, whereas the COVID response by and large across the world of governments has been to intervene on the side of workers to say, okay, we recognize you either you can't go to work or that you no longer have a job. We, the governments, certainly in the UK, uh, uh, have stepped in to pay people's wages. During the Black Death, it was uh, the the intervention was on the side of the employers. It was to say that this is, obviously untenable if 
uh, if the political class, most of whom are landowners, now have to pay triple, quadruple the wages they're accustomed to, it's going to be the ruin of us all. Uh, and so that economic response is in itself um, quite telling about the, the worldview and the mindset of the ruling elite of the day. But what's interesting in the medium to long term is that the enforcement of those labour laws goes way beyond the first wave of the Black Death. Now, the Black Death comes in waves in the 1340s, in the 1360s, in the 1370s, in the 1390s, and quite severe secondary waves. And so whenever there's a wave, there tends to be a wave of enforcement of the labour laws. And so what be it becomes a regular sight across England, what, what becomes a regular sight across England is the arrival of uh, royal commissioners, royal judges, investigating breaches and, and prosecuting breaches of the labour law. So there's a massive intrusion of government into people's lives specifically for the purpose of suppressing their wages and punishing them if they've been taking wages that are deemed too high by the government. What that coincides with 30 years after the, uh, 40 years, after, 35 years after the beginning of the Black Death is, uh, is then a, is a series of poll taxes designed to raise money for the, the Hundred Years' War at the end of Edward III's reign, the beginning of Richard II's reign. And those are conditions that lead to the Peasants' Revolt, which is what I, I read a book about 10 or 12 years ago. Which but I think that, that Dan, was the first time I encountered your work. Uh, the, the book uh, Summer of Blood is a, a very readable history of, of the peasants' revolt, and uh, I went back to it when I was writing Doom to ask the question, uh, do, do pandemics often get followed after a lag by uh, major political disruptions? And, and your answer is yes, because yes. restrictions that were designed to, to, to hold down uh, wages ultimately led to a, a full-blown revolt against not just royal authority but the authority of landlords and their their courts and their powers yeah that's right and i think actually i i was i've been thinking about that material obviously since i wrote summer of blood and i think that was published in 2009 in the, it was first published in 2009 writing during this pandemic gave me a, a a chance to think about that material again. And I was very struck actually by, so throughout the second half of the 14th century, there are the, the what we can loosely term populist or popular populist rebellions around Europe. There's the Jacquerie in France in the 1350s, the Peasants Revolt in England in the 1380s. There are clusters of, of these revolts, the Jumpy revolts in, in, uh, in Italy, in Florence. There are clusters of revolt that seem to coincide with waves of the Black Death. But what's interesting about them is they're not specifically targeted, they're not specifically anti pandemic policy revolts. They take in a, a much broader attack on the status quo in general. You know, if we think about the watchword of the rebels of the Peasants' Revolt, when Adam delved and Eve span, who then was the gentleman? I mean, it was almost apocalyptic in character. It, it sought to completely rethink the way that society was organized. No more lords, no more bishops, all land redistributed. It's a sort of communist, proto-communist um, ideology that underpins it. Now, that, that obviously goes way beyond the English government's pandemic response. And I was thinking about it during COVID because of course the, the waves of uh, protest that we saw across the world during COVID, you know, Black Lives Matter movement, were not in and of themselves really connected with directly connected to COVID, but they do seem to be part of a broader fabric of, of re-examination of how the world is working. That is, is brought into focus by the arrival of a pandemic. Yes, I think that's right. And a number of, of writers, including Andrew Sullivan, noted the almost religious character of uh, many of the Black Lives Matter protests last year, making me certainly think of uh, of expiation, a uh, kind of collective uh, attempt to atone for past sins of racism and, and slavery. Uh, that, that certainly, as I was reading about the Black Death, resonated with me. So it seems like we can read this book uh, partly with our own time in mind and, and, and learn from it that 
that a public health disaster like a, a pandemic can be followed by all kinds of cascades of uh, economic, social, and, and, and political change. But let me take a, a, a step back now and, and allow you to present uh, the, the book in its, in its totality. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a history of the Middle Ages, which is, which is a, a term perhaps we should spend a little time on. As I was reading it, I was thinking, this is a little bit like reading a new version of Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire, because Gibbon covers roughly the same time frame and, and essentially presents the kind of the Middle Ages as the dissolution of the Roman Empire and the reinvention or partial reinvention of, of Europe. Uh, and, uh, of course, the encounter between Christianity and, and Islam, which plays a big part in your in your story. Was, was Gibbon an influence in your deciding to write a book that covered this time span? Uh, probably not an influence in deciding to write the book, but as soon as I took on the challenge of writing the book, absolutely. I mean, you can't es escape from Gibbon in this period, or certainly, you know, in, in the conception of, uh, of how to approach the Middle Ages. Um, the desire to write the book it came really from having written nine previous books that that went from English dynastic history uh, to specific events in again in English history, Magna Carta or the Peasants' Revolt, and then doing a couple of books on crusading history, a book about the Templars and a book called Crusaders, which really covered a, a long a long stretch of the Middle Ages. And I firstly I found in writing those books that. Um, I enjoy working on that kind of scale. I like the the, the broad sweep of a story, um, I, I, and I thought, well, what gets what's bigger than doing the Crusades? And I thought that, that it would be possible to do a history of the whole, a single volume history of the whole of the Middle Ages that joined up everything from the sack of Rome in four ten to the sack of Rome in fifteen twenty seven, uh, and in doing so, might offer perspective on a lot of the things that I'd written about previously. I thought, you know, I'd been thinking that having written a book about the Plantagenets, I wanted to do something that put that in the broader context, both temporally, geographically, of, of what else was going on during the Middle Ages. And I thought it, was be, it would be a good way to do, as a, a term I've used already tonight, to demystify the Middle Ages somewhat. I mean, almost inherent in the term is a, a distancing and you know one of the first if not the first people to use the uh, roughly the term the middle ages is john fox in fox's book of martyrs acts and monuments 1564 mm. and fox writing from you know, the, the protestant side of the reformation see, speaks of three ages of history the primitive time pre-christian rome his own time you know the, the modern age and then the middle age the bit in the middle and so sort of by definition uh a bit that's that's slightly regrettable uh, that falls between two greater ages. Um, the word medieval, as we know, is now a pejorative term beloved of uh, politicians and journalists as uh, uh, a byword for things that are brutal or stupid or wrong or uh, in other ways um, at odds with our progressive values. Um, but it'd been my sense, having written about the Middle Ages for for quite a long time that there were things we could learn and things that we could find common ground with during the Middle Ages. So I wanted to, to present a, a, a popular narrative history that attempted to do that. And so as you as you picked up on, one of the ways I thought it, it would be, one of the ways I wanted to try and get people to think about the Middle Ages as being approachable was to introduce apparently modern themes in the narrative. And while I worked, I had five of them uh, on the pin board, which is next to my desk. And they were climate change, mass migration, pandemic disease, global networks, and technological change. Because I thought that all of these can be found in the Middle Ages and all of these would be resonant with a 21st century audience. Now I have to say, I came up with that list before COVID, which is why pandemics were only third on it. Uh, and and not the top of the list, but but I, what I tried to do in writing the book was draw them up through the narrative so that we we encounter them repeatedly throughout the book, and and I think that that uh, the introduction of those themes 
I hope makes the Middle Ages a little more approachable than traditionally they, they are. I'm just gonna let the dog out of the room. Dogs. Sorry. Dogs, like children, always want to be let out of the room so that they can then request to be let back <laughs> into the room. <laughs> Which is exactly what you're going to do, yes. Uh, this is not the end of your interactions with, uh, uh, with your uh, dog. <laughs> I, um, I, I, you know, never to work with, with uh, children and animals, uh, even on Zoom. I, uh, I was wondering, as I was uh, looking at, at that list of, of the recognisable, uh, what what was missing, and and what uh, I did was to think back to my own undergraduate uh, days in in Oxford in the nineteen eighties. We were all required to do at least some history of the Middle Ages, and at Magdalen College, quite a lot because after all, we had Carl Leiser there, uh, mm. who wanted us to study Ottonian uh, Germany and uh, and read. Uh, uh, Charlemagne, uh, and uh, we also had uh, Gerald Harris, uh, one of the great uh, historians of, uh, of, uh, of medieval England. And I had certainly arrived at Oxford with a pretty romantic uh, notion in my mind of the Middle Ages, I'll call it the Ivanhoe version, the Walter Scott romantic version of the Middle Ages. And it was a terribly crushing experience to be told, no, 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 None of that is really of any interest. We are going to study the formation of the state. And in particular, we're going to look at origins of, uh, of, of the English uh, common law and the first uh, discernible outlines of some constitutional order, or at least of a system of public finance. Uh, and so I have to ask you in the spirit of Gerald Harris, where are the pipe rolls? Where's <laughs> all that, the sort of thing that, that I was encouraged to, to study at Oxford and to see as central to, to the history of the Middle Ages? So did you just leave that out because it's a bit boring and dry or do we, do we no longer think that's important? Well, no, and, and I mean, my uh, influence, my Two, my, my two great influences when I was at Cambridge were David Starkey, who taught me to write, and Christine Carpenter, who was part of the, the you know, the apostolic succession, which came down from Bruce McFarlane uh, and, and included Gerald Harris. Um, so I'd spent an awful lot of time thinking in constitution about constitutional legal history of England, the Middle Ages. I've written a book about Magna Carta. The, uh, and so in a way that... Uh, it wasn't on the list because it was on, on my mind so permanently in any case. Um, I, I think, that, I mean, as I was writing the book, a lot of this came out and particularly the, uh, the development of law and constitutions. But I, I, I felt that that also would not ping a 21st century audience in quite the same way as this list. So I've tried to, sm frankly, I've tried to smuggle in some of the more old fashioned, quote unquote, uh, medieval history that I grew up studying. Yes, because um, we get monks and we get knights and we get crusaders, but we don't see so much of the tax collectors and the lawyers. That's right. Uh, all the all the popes, you know. And, and in fact, while I was writing the book, I had a conversation with David Stark, and then he said, "What are you, what are you, what are you doing at the moment? Oh, I'm doing this history of the Middle Ages, and here are some of the chapters I'm doing." Well, where's your chapter on popes? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> there's not going to be a chapter on popes. Popes will appear. Innocent the Third is getting his day, and the Fourth Lateran Council will happen, but they're going to be approached from from different angles. And he sort of he's well, I see, you're doing it all wrong. Uh, but he always tells me I'm doing it all wrong. Whatever you know. Whatever I'm doing, it's, that's the, <laughs> he's been telling me that for the last twenty years. So, um, I I just felt as I was writing it that uh, when you're doing, as you you know this very well, doing popular facing narrative history is about meeting your audience somewhere in the middle. And uh, I often quote uh, Jay Z. When I talk about this, Jay Z, who uh, the, it is the not rapper. everyone who goes from David Starkey to Jay Z. No, it's not without it's not. missing a beat. Uh, <laughs> Jay Z says you've got to feed him sugar, 
And what Jay-Z meant by that was he when he started out making rap albums about being a, uh, a crack dealer who'd avoided going to jail for life and so on and, and, the, and ro- romanticizing the glamour of the streets. That was what he was selling, a sort of thug gangster lifestyle. But he was also a sort of conscious, uh, socially aware um, citizen of the United States who, who had a real message about... Uh, about or a critique of society at least that he wanted to offer but is was aware that the weight that you can't sell that head on and so he says you've got to feed him sugar you've got to come in with the gangster stuff and then smuggle the message through the back door and, and that's something that I've, I've come back to uh, over time as a sort of guiding principle to writing popular history which is you've got to have the battles and the romantic and the Ivanhoe because people coming to the to buy a book about the middle ages expect it and if it's not there, they'll say, why is it not there? Um, but beneath, so then the, the, the task is then to triangulate between that and the more serious stuff of medieval history, which, uh, you know, the pure, the uncut stuff, um, and, and try and, and find a, a happy medium between them in the books. Or at least that's, that's what I've come to believe. I want to uh, pursue this uh, question of, of sugar uh, uh, and and the uncut stuff. But first, let me remind our audience that uh, the way to pose questions uh, to Dan is through the Q and A uh, function on Zoom. Uh, we've already got a couple of questions, and we'll come to them uh, very shortly. But my sense is that we must have more lurking out there that are forming in people's minds. So do please put them there, and I'll be uh, relaying them uh, in a short time to to Dan. Uh, let, let's talk about climate uh, change, and uh, th- this was probably, as you said, up up above the the pandemic problem when you f- first thought of doing the book. We are uh, coming out of the COP twenty six conference uh, in Glasgow, and oddly enough, I had a conversation earlier today with uh, some folks at the Santa Fe Institute, including the science fiction writer. Uh, uh, Neil Stevenson, and uh, lo and behold, he began to talk about some of the uh, examples of of climate change uh, uh, and climate uh, disruption that you talk about. Uh, So I have a strange sense of worlds meeting when uh, a, a a British historian and an American science fiction author are talking about the same things on the same day. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the the climate part of your story. One reason the Black Death impacts Europe's population uh, so very severely is that there's already been a pretty rough time in terms of climate and weather prior to the arrival of uh, the bubonic plague. Give us the the climate piece of your story, please. Well, as we know, through throughout history, there have the Earth's climate has moved in cycles, and uh, the trajectory. I, th- you know, the common consensus is that at the moment, climate change is being driven by man-made factors. But that just because that's what's happening at the moment doesn't mean that there's never been any sort of sort of climate change before. In the course of this period, the Middle Ages, which in the book I cover in about 1100 years, there are several major shifts or several important shifts in in the world's climate and in the regional climate in Western Europe. At the beginning of the book, we see the shift from what's known as the Roman climate optimum. Uh, so temperatures drop a little and the uh, weather becomes slightly drier, it becomes less um, less conducive to, frank, to, in short, the Roman Empire feeding itself in the West. And I think that historians are now starting to see that as framing for, uh, for the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. Uh, that coincides with a mega drought in the Far East, which historians again are starting to, to see as having set in chain the waves of migration, beginning with the Huns, the Goths, the, the, the Alans. Uh, who end up in the Roman Empire and and are part of that destabilizing process. To fast forward to the beginning of the 14th century, here again we see a a significant drop in global temperatures, uh, which is heralds the beginning of a period 
colloquially known as the Little Ice Age. There's been a lot of, of, of writing scholarly and, um, and journalistic and, and popular about linking the Little Ice Age to various different significant historical events. There was a, a piece in time not so long ago linking the French Revolution to the Little Ice Age. But what you certainly see from the beginning of the 14th century onwards is a series of, as you've written about in Doom, of, of disasters. So to take one example, at the beginning of the, uh, the 14th century, between about the years 1314 and 1322, there are in Western Europe a series of years with no summer. And that, of course, in an age where people's fortunes and livelihoods uh, and lives are far more tied to the skies and to the land than they are today, that is very bad news. And the brings the, the great famine of the early 14th century in which perhaps 10% of the population die. Now that's comparable, I think, uh, in fact, it may, may be somewhat worse than the Russian famine of the beginning of the 20th century and one of the most devastating famine. Now in absolute numbers, there are fewer people probably died during the great famine in the middle ages, but that's only because the world population was so much larger in the 20th century. So that's the, that's the beginning of the, of the 14th century. A, a generation, a couple of generations later, well, th then we see a, a, uh, an animal pandemic, a pan zootic. Then we see the first wave of the Black Death, 1347 through 1351. So there are these series of major, major disasters, catastrophes that strike Western Europe and, uh, and Eurasia more generally, which seem to stem from an abrupt change in the world's climate around the beginning of the 14th century. Are there other factors? Yes, there are, there are other factors, but that, that is the, the broad framing for a, a a calamitous century to use Barbara Tuckman's stuff. In my conversation with Neil Stevenson is that massive volcanic activity, five huge volcanic events from around 1150 to 1300, uh, including the eruption of Mount Samalus in, in what is now Indonesia in 1257, look like prime suspects for this period of global cooling. Uh, we, we haven't had a really massive uh, volcanic eruption uh, emitting millions of tons of sulfate aerosols since Tambora in 1815. And I keep thinking, the more I hear about uh, climate change, man-made climate change and global warming, the more I feel we're inviting nature to give us another spate of massive volcanic eruptions and transform the debate in a relatively short space of time to one about cooling. But this seems to me to be why your your approach to history, writing on a on a larger scale than perhaps is fashionable in academia, and looking beyond uh, the confines of of English history where your career began, uh, gets us some really valuable insights. Uh, this sort of big history was frowned upon, uh, certainly uh, in in the earlier part of my career, but. I'm wondering just on a purely kind of practical basis, is it only possible to write this kind of history outside academia? You're not uh, somebody who's pursuing tenure at a US university or cranking out supervisions at, at Cambridge. Do, do you think the only way you're able to write books on this scale is precisely that you're outside the academic structure? Yeah, I mean, I, uh... I'm incredibly unfashionable, if you, if I assume, viewed from inside a university, incredibly unfashionable, doing things that are, that fly in the face of all the current academic trends, you know, micro studies and the absolute obsession with identity as the, you know, the, the most uh, fascinating thing to study or to, to drag out of history. I'm not interested in any of those things. I'm interested in what, uh, I, ordinary people are interested. Now, you know, the, the television work certainly helped with that. You know, I realised doing doing a lot of televisions for Channel Five in the UK, which is uh, is a channel which aims at a a middle market, you know, a sort of tabloid approach to history. And I realised pretty 
pretty quickly, having done that work, that there is there are lots of people who are very interested in history, but don't feel enormously well served, uh, certainly by works that are closer to the academic trends currently. Um, and so I try and fill a gap and I don't, I, I'm freed, yeah, Neil, I'm freed by not having to worry in the slightest about any of the concerns that would come with being within a university. And there, there are things that I, I'm very nostalgic for, uh, you know, my short time in Cambridge, just as an undergraduate, uh, I enjoyed immensely, and I still keep maintain close links with my college, which is Pembroke, Cambridge, and I have a, a deep fondness and affection for Cambridge, but I see absolutely no place for me within it. You know, the closest I can imagine getting to a university would be that somebody would ask me to come and do a course on public history, how to engage the public. But beyond that, there's, I, I, it's just, I'm, I'm never going to get close to it. And I, I, I'm not sure if that's a cause for regret or if I would be wasting my time regretting it. But I certainly 20 years ago, and I, as I've said, I was taught by David Starkey. And, and at that time, now whether David was a, a total anom anomaly at that point, but David was still, to, was still connected with Cambridge, uh, was still lecturing in the faculty. He, he was coming up and supervising me. And he was also on Channel 4, a, a channel in the, the UK, drawing six million people, which doesn't sound like a lot, I'm sure, to an American audience, but believe me, it's an enormous number of people to watch programmes about Elizabeth I on, on Channel 4 on weeknights. And he was sort of a, a, a celebrity don doing public-facing history from within a university. But I don't see that that's enormously possible, except for really you. Is, is there anyone else that's doing it? Well, it's it's interesting that you you uh, say that. I was I was reflecting on how much you have in common with Tom Holland, who's a, another yes. writer of history who's really outside the of the uh, of the academic system, but has has found a, a really large audience for his his writing uh, on uh, ancient Rome and uh, more recently on uh, Islam and the and the history of Christianity. Dominions are. A, a, a mm. book that I thought thought did brilliantly well, history on the large, uh, on the largest scale, and uh, you and he seem to me to have have just drawn the conclusion that you can do this kind of historical research without the infrastructure uh, and the constraints of of academia. Uh, I'm going to um, ask one more question, and then I'm going to turn to uh, the the Q and A uh, bar. Uh, this this is a question about economic history, and I'm afraid I'm I'm by uh, training uh, by by my point of origin an economic historian, and I I, I get very excited when uh, there's new work in this area. When Mark Bailey did his Ford lectures on, in effect, the economics of of the Black Death in England, I absolutely inhaled those uh, lectures. Let, let's talk a bit about a fascinating thing that happens after. Uh, the, the Black Death, uh, because it's not all bad. It's not all uh, uh, statutes of laborers and peasants revolts. In some ways, the labor shortages and the, the crisis uh, that, that strikes Europe produce a remarkably creative response. Uh, I remember as an undergraduate reading about the monetization, uh, the increased monetization of the economy. You could, you could try to stop people paying higher wages but if you if you if you have a labor shortage they're going to pay higher wages no matter how hard you try and there's also a great increase in in, in trade in the period after uh, the, the 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 blighted middle of the 14th century so I want you to take us from the doldrums of uh, of the Black Death to the sunlit uplands of uh, Florence on the eve of the Renaissance uh, how did that happen? Because there seems to be something rather extraordinary that, that takes place, at least in parts of Europe, northern Italy, England, that looks economically, well, a lot like growth, innovation. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. Yeah, all of those things. Um, you know, and it, it, every cloud has a silver lining. The cloud of losing 60% of people to what it looks like an apocalypse is that, well, I mean, this is in, in a sense quite an old fashioned uh, 
argument, which which is goes back to Poston, which says that there was in Western Europe effectively a Malthusian crisis at the beginning of, of the 14th century, that there were, there were more people than the available technologies and land could really sustain, and that in a sense, uh, the, the Great Famine and the, the plague that followed it were inevitable um, shakings out of, of population versus resources. But certainly what you see after the Black Death is, is this cultural and economic revival. Now, I think some of this does predate the Black Death. And we, we should look really to what medieval historians call the commercial revolution of the 12th and 13th centuries, in which uh, trade networks, both within and around Europe and regional trade networks, stretching all the way into the the newly assembled Mongol Empire, start a much more rapid movement of goods around the, the world and around Europe. And we start to see trade fairs in Champagne and in Flanders flourishing. And we start to see the innovations of companies and of uh, insurance and of double entry bookkeeping of the and of credit transfer these very fundamental things to building a sophisticated money based economy these all predate the black death but i think that they then coincide after the black death with a market which is much as you rightly say which is is much better for workers in which there are higher wages available in which labor is in demand uh, in which, so you know, in the English case, we see a final withering away of serfdom, which had been a, a, you know, a bondage to the land, which had been a part of the medieval social and economic structures for many centuries. I mean, by the middle of the 15th century, there is no serfdom at all. And when we see the, the, the rebellion of Jack Cade, and you compare that to the Peasants' Revolt, the concerns of the lower orders in the 15th century are far more sophisticated, far more politically engaged than they had be, been at the end of, of the 14th century. Uh, and what I try to do in Powers and Thrones is to illustrate that change um, through anecdotes. And I think one of the best figures you can see in the 15th century as a sort of symbol of... Um, of this new economy is somebody like Dick Whittington, who we know in, in England as a pantomime character. He's a character who appears on the stage at, uh, around Christmas time as a, a game lad with a prodigal cat and a knapsack on his back. Well, in fact, the real career of Richard Whittington shows you the rampaging medieval capitalist at his finest. You know, he's a, he's a mercer, he's, he's trading fine cloth imported into Europe from the Far East through it, Italian cities, he's trading other commodities, he's part of London's government, serves as London, mayor of London four times, mayor of Calais once, so he's on both ends of the staple, uh, which organises trade between England and the continent. He's uh, a publicly minded um, citizen who leaves all of his money in cash to the city of London for good causes. You know, there's still people living today in houses, in social housing that was originally subsidized by Dick Whittington's will in 1423. Mm -hmm. So you're right, after the Black Death, there is this extraordinary renewal. And of course, the, the wider context, as, as you mentioned, is in Florence with the Medici and these other extraordinarily rich families taking the profits of banking or business and turning it into this cultural renewal of, of great art, of great uh, sculpture, of great architecture. Um, and you're right, I mean, this is, this, is the flour this is the Renaissance, this is the flourishing of a new world and, and new ways of thinking about the world, which, which, which we can also see coming in through the uh, through Reformation on the uh, Q&A uh, bar, and I'm going to um, uh, go to uh, a, a question from Michael Murdoch, uh, which relates back to Gibbon and I rather like. Uh, I'm going to press you to keep answers brief now so that we can get to yeah. as many uh, viewers as possible. Which of Gibbon's arguments have best weathered the test of time? Which do you view as being most incorrect, but still influence our perception of the Middle Ages? 
Well, I think that the argument that there is a, a, a struggle for what Chris Wickham, a contemporary scholar, is called the inheritance of Rome is the one that's lasted best. Uh, I think that the idea that there is a an eternal civilizational duel between Christianity and Islam is the one that's been most problematic. And certainly writers about the Crusades are constantly having to struggle with this assumption that um, from the outset, Christianity and Islam are enemies and there's a zero sum game between them. So I, I think those do. from Karina Parisi. The US Supreme Court's considering a case concerning the extent of the con constitutional right to bear arms in public. Among the reasons cited in favor of government regulation of bearing arms in public are English statutes, such as the Statute of Northampton of 1328. This argument is thought to appeal to those members of the court who seek to understand the meaning of the words in the constitution based on the understanding of those who drafted them over 200 years ago. Has your historical research led you to any conclusions about the extent of an Englishman's right to carry arms in public. I can remember a supervision in 1999 where my supervisor, Helen Castor at Cambridge was talking about precisely this and the origins of uh, well, ideas about the Second Amendment as stretching back to the responsibility laid on communities to police themselves and part of that responsibility being to bear arms so that they could do that, which was laid upon them originally by Edward I and was sort of followed up periodically throughout the Middle Ages. Um, that was an entirely appropriate uh, way of organizing community policing in an age with no police forces. Um, it seems to me to be less appropriate in an age where we do have uh, organized central policing, whatever we think about the, the quality of the people doing the policing or the, the uh, prejudices or otherwise of those institutions, we are in an age where that is an, an, a social and a norm of social organization. And I think that actually then the uh, it becomes more problematic if you also cleave to the idea that everybody has a right to bear arms as well. I mean, that's a recipe for big, big problems. Big Can problems. we break off just to talk a little bit more about violence? Because I remember reading uh, Greg Clark's book, A Farewell to Arms, and, and Steve Pinker's recent work, and, and being reminded that uh, what's uh, striking about the modern era is relatively low levels uh, of, uh, of violence, of homicide, and, and that's striking because they used to be quite high. Uh, and, and so talk a little bit about how much more violent uh, the Middle Ages were. People were routinely carrying uh, daggers, uh, uh, swords if they were upmarket, and, and casual violence, fights are uh, a pretty recurrent feature of of life should we think of the middle ages as a violent time is it like being in the roughest part of chicago only with uh, with uh, <laughs> with with knives rather than guns yeah i think we should i think this is an age where it's normal uh, and indeed expected for certainly for men to carry weapons and be trained to use them it's also a time i believe where people are somewhat more routinely slightly drunk than they otherwise would be. I mean, there's, there's a, a, a big culture of everybody drinking quite a lot all the time. And, you know, again, when I was, I was studying medieval legal history, the, the records are teeming with uh, casual fights which lead to somebody being stabbed and, or, or beaten or... Yeah, this, this is a, a violent society and violence is, is a norm. And again, as, you, as you've written in Doom, death is also normal. Uh, the presence of death, the, the, the low um, life expectancies, partly owing to very high child mortality, but the presence of death, the presence of violence, is, is much higher than it is today. And that doesn't mean that people don't care about it at all, but I think they tend to be 
a little less squeamish about individual examples of death and violence than perhaps we are today in a world where they are relatively uncommon. Let me go to a question from the enigmatically named Flux. If you could get in a time machine and witness any single event in the medieval period without being personally harmed, which uh, is worth <laughs> adding after what we just said, what event would you witness and why? I think I might witness the coronation of Charlemagne, Christmas Day in Rome, 800, uh, dressed as a Roman, in, you know, par he's been parading around Rome in a, in a toga, uh, which must have been incredibly unlikely, uh, an incredibly unlikely sight. And I, because this really is a moment from which so much stems for hundreds of years afterwards, and this this constant power struggle between popes and emperors for uh, for supremacy in Europe can be traced back to this this moment of Charlemagne's coronation. If I could have one other view, I would think I would go as a war reporter to Jerusalem in 1099 and witness the fall of Jerusalem to the first crusaders because I get I think that's that's a real event of world changing importance for hundreds of years thereafter you know the struggle to keep Jerusalem in in crusader Christian hands the struggle to regain Jerusalem once it's lost to Saladin in 1187 the presence Present. culturally and in the, the popular imagination of Jerusalem, I think is is an enormously important is enormously important in the later Middle Ages, and again, you know, it comes back to that fall in in July to ninety nine. Well, uh, uh, Dan Jones, I I'm afraid I'm um, just about out of, of of time, and we're not going to, as a result, get to all uh, the questions. But you you ended on a very appropriate note in discussing a book entitled Powers and thrones, uh, we uh, had a vision, a striking vision of, of Charlemagne uh, at his coronation and a striking vision of one of the great uh, moments in the history of the, the Crusades, the clash of civilizations as uh, Gibbon represents it and Sam Huntington still wrote about it many, many, many years later. I've uh, hugely enjoyed the book and I've hugely enjoyed our conversation. I urge everybody not only to buy a copy of Powers and Thrones, but also to buy several as uh, Christmas uh, gifts for friends and family. Uh, my work is done. I, I'm glad to uh, see that your dog has obviously calmed down. Uh, thank you, Dan and Maria. I think the last word belongs to you. Yeah, I, I do have one more last question then uh, a while back. You teased about working on a novel. Any news on that? I'm delivering the first of a trilogy set in the Hundred Years' War uh, to my publishers uh, just before Christmas. So oh. um, that is, that's coming. Great first news. one set in 1346, then one in 1347. And uh, it's, I call it medieval apocalypse now. Okay, perfect. A small something, platoon fighting yeah. their way through France. That's something next year. To look, something to look forward to. Well, thank you, Dan and Neil, uh, and a big thank you to our audience who joined in today. Um, use the link in, in the chat box and, and buy Powers and Thrones and other titles we mentioned today. Um, you can also visit our website, politics-pros.com, browse around and check for the, the most current updated uh, event listings. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, we have a great list of, of events to, to choose from. Um, thank you again, Dan and Neil. It's been a pleasure hosting you today. And um, here's hoping we'll do it uh, in person next time. Take care, everybody, and have a good night. Have a good night.